Resources Reserve Bank in Richmond, Virginia. He heads the Policy Analysis Unit and is responsible for bank supervision policy matters, research and supervision of risk models at major financial institutions based in the United States. Well, I guess based globally, actually. Um, he, he, he focuses on assessing compliance and regulatory requirements, Basel II Capital Accord, and his particular focus is on asset pricing and operational risk modeling. Um, prior to the role that he now has, um, he was a financial economist in the quantitative analyst an analytics unit of the FR of the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston, Massachusetts, and also served as an associate professor at Pitzer College in Claremont. Um, his educational background is he's done a MA in economics in here in, in, in Europe, in Belgium, and did his PhD in economics at UCLA. Um, and with that, and uh, I guess a little bit of background, we actually had a long conversation in Amsterdam and in New York um, about the possibility of his, his coming to visit us here in, in UCL. And um, when, we, when we last spoke in, in New York, uh, he said, I'm going to be in South Africa. You're just around the corner. Uh, so here he is. Without further ado, welcome. Time. Well, I was really happy that uh, Don offered this, because I don't know if uh, you've ever tried to be for 18 hours in a plane, which is what it takes to go from BC to uh, South Africa. And I was not looking forward to doing that on the way back, so I was very happy to be able to justify breaking it down. Having, they appreciate it. Having mm -hmm. the Fed pay for <laughs> my stop over here. Good. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, so my understanding is that this is a uh, mixed audience, but primarily made up of um, engineering people. Well, why don't we just take yeah? Why don't I get a? Can, can I can I just ask the MSCs in financial risk management? I hope a couple of people raise their hand. Risk management. Okay, uh, financial see. maths. Um, okay. PhD. There's a lot of people that raise their hand. What am I missing? Well, what are you guys in the front? Oh, uh, of course. Okay, so these guys are. Uh, M There's a lot of folks here. Are MSCs in. Um, let me get it right. Engineering with finance. Who are the engineering with finance? Oh God. Okay. Okay. Um, and then maybe the real gentleman nice. over there in the middle, uh, right there. W where are you from? Um, Not country, but what? <laughs> <laughs> economics. Economics. Okay. Oh, so How we have here economics. economics. <laughs> wow, boy. Okay, that's my team. Target, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very impressed. Okay, so you did better than the engineers. Okay. Going I told to you it was mixed. How many lawyers here? <laughs> no, they want to keep quiet. Okay. <laughs> Good. And industry folks? How many folks from industry? Oh, here? we've got industry people. Yep. Okay, oh, so God. you're going to be quoted here. <laughs> Anybody from the press here? <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good one. I, I got in trouble with that one in the past. So. <laughs> we all have. Yeah. So uh, first things first, I, I have to, you know, I have to give you my disclaimer, which is whatever I'm going to say here uh, represents only my own views and not those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond or the Federal Reserve System. Um, given the nature of the topic, I think that it, it's a really important disclaimer, and I want to make sure that uh, I emphasize it, that you know, I'm going to give my own views on what stress testing is, and, uh, uh, and not at all. I mean, my views obviously are very have been formed by the Fed, so <laughs> there, there's some overlap there that um, I, I do want to emphasize it as well. Good. So, Don asked me to, uh, to give a talk, that, which is pretty much a talk that, I've been, that I gave in Amsterdam, but to um, add some background for people who might not be as familiar with stress testing as, uh, you know, as we are at the Fed, because we do that day in and day out. So I I'm going to try to first give you a general overview of stress testing in finance, which, you know, it, <laughs> There are as many definitions of stress testing in finance as there are people who deal with it. And so it, you know, it's, it's always good to start with a, an overview of what stress testing means. And uh, what I've gotten in the habit of doing is trying to give people what I call the, uh, the taxonomy of stress testing. 
in the sense that all these definitions of stress testing that exist out there are all valid definitions of stress testing. It just depends on what it is that you want to do with stress testing. Um, and so we'll get to that in, ah, in the presentation. So first things first is how did we get here or there? Um, now, why is it that stress testing has become such an important uh, piece of uh, bank supervision? Uh, very much so in the US, but I mean, if you look at what's happening in Europe, it's the same thing here in Europe. Uh, everybody is talking about stress testing. Up to the crisis, uh, stress testing was uh, very much an afterthought. Um, and now it's become you know, part of the, I, I guess it's become the most important piece in many people's view of uh, bank regulation. I, I, by the way, don't think that that's, a, that's necessarily a good thing. I think stress testing is a very important piece of bank supervision, um, but it, it needs to be put in context. And I think that if you look at what's been happening, is the pendulum might have swung too far in the stress testing camp, and, and people might be overdoing it, and in a way replacing uh, many uh, sound aspects of modeling with stress testing and the some other sound aspects of a man, a bank supervision with stress testing, which is not necessarily a good thing. So, how did we get here? First thing is the crisis really highlighted the limits of models. Uh, if you look at how models were used in the build up to the crisis, there was this blind trust in modeling. Um, you know, banks and risk managers in particular started adopting more and more quantitative techniques to manage the risk. And I'm, I'm an economist. I'm a, you know, I did my PhD in asset pricing. And if you ask me about models, I think models are a very important tool. And you know, I spent my whole life building models. So I'm very happy to see that banks started adopting quantitative techniques to manage their risk and that they're not just like, you know, trying to manage risk uh, by guesstimating what their risk is. But what, what really started happening in the industry was that people would adopt the models and never question them. And I think the reason you, you start seeing that kind of behavior is that the modelers were not necessarily the risk managers. People who manage the risk, people who manage the banks, were not necessarily very good at understanding the models. They would hire very good modelers, give them the problem, ask them to solve it. Modelers would, would come and say, well, here's your solution, here's your bar. And then they would go happily and do their thing with their new with their bar and think that they, you know, they they had managed their risk by having somebody model. So what happened here is that people didn't question <coughs> the models. And as we all know, when you build a model, you're basically some, you know, you, you're basically <coughs> making a number of assumptions. And yeah, I like to to think of it as you know, you're approximating locally what's happening in from a risk perspective. And if you deviate a little bit, you know, you're, on the, you're at the tangent. So you're, pretty, you're, you're still good. And the, but the more you deviate from the assumptions, or the more you deviate from the conditions under which you build the model, the more likely your model is to fail. And people, what happens, people really didn't think of it. And so we started going into this world of where models were driving a, a lot of the decision without uh, being second guessed, and so I think that that was really the the, the, the first big mistake uh, that we saw. Uh, so basically, this is model dogmatism that led us to blinding, blindingly trusting models, and and basically over relying on them. So I think as a result of this and of the failures of these models. After the crisis, you saw regulators start asking for stress testing because they want people, they want institutions to actually 
try to start moving away from this local, you know, this local approximation and understand you know, what it is that we will take for a model to test. So that's a general picture, I think, of why stress testing has become so important. But it, it's a really a general introduction. Let me actually now start the presentation in earnest. So first thing is that the, you know, the general theme of the presentation is all about model error, basically. It's about the <coughs> fact that models are an approximation. And you know, I found these two quotes. And I, this is my favorite quote of all as a risk manager. Um, uh, it's a quote that I hated when he said it. <laughs> now he's gone. It's OK. But now I. <laughs> Now, the more I think about it, I might not really like the individual, or at least what he did at that point in time. Uh, the more I, I read his quote, the more I realize he, he actually really had a good point. Um, it's a famous uh, Don Rumsfeld quote. Of, uh, there are things we know we know, and then there's the unknown, the, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And um, I guess the unknown unknowns will always remain unknown unknowns, but the known unknowns are what stress testing, in a way, are try is trying to address, right? The, the, the no, no, the, the, you know that there are things. Yeah, you see, it's so <laughs> stress testing. So there, you, <laughs> so you know that there are things you don't know, and that's what stress testing is all about: is trying to understand the limits of what you know and uh, explore that. And uh, Fokion already saw this in Amsterdam. So my take on it, uh, being Greek or half Greek, um, I took a more philosophical approach to it. And I see very much model risk as um, the allegory of the cave. Who, who knows the allegory of the cave? And Greeks are not allowed to answer. <laughs> no? So the allegory of the cave is very simple. It is, it's Plato's um, <coughs> take on uh, on model risk. So basically, the idea is people are you know humans are chained, and all they can see is the wall. And on the wall, there are reflections of reality. Basically, reality happens behind their backs, and so shapes walk behind them, and there's a fire behind the shapes. And all they can see is not they cannot see the shapes that are walking behind them. But all they can see are the, you know, the shadows cast by these shapes on the wall. And the way I like to think of it is that this is us, the modelers, in the banking world. And the shapes are our portfolios and the true risk we're exposed to. And what we see here is the materialization of risk uh, when, we, as in, when we operate as an institution. And we need to be aware of the fact that when we are building a model, what we are working with is not reality, but this reflection of reality, or this, you know, if you want to put it in technical terms, this sample, which is, you know, you're not dealing with the population, you're dealing with a sample. And the allegory of the cave is exactly that. And we are the modelers who are chained to the wall. And uh, I, I'm not saying we, can, we should unchain ourselves, but stress testing is a way for us to remind ourselves of the fact that we don't change the world. Okay? So this is all good and nice. Now everybody accepts stress testing as being the, you know, as I said earlier, actually many people see it as the main, you know, the, the building block of, uh, of risk management and bank supervision. But this is a far cry from where we were a few years ago. A few years ago, people really poo-pooed stress testing. You know, it's, uh, it, people didn't really believe in it. And part of the reason was it, it's not clean, it's not elegant. You, you know, modeling under a very nice, clean assumption is elegant. You, know, you can build a nice, I don't know, Gaussian the model and come up with a very nice, clean, tight result and your, and your VAR and pre present that to management and present them the results that they want to see and that's it. Stress testing, not so much because you have to make assumptions, about, you know, you have to break the assumptions of your model. You have to start thinking of things that have not happened but that and trying to estimate the impact of the things that have not happened on your model. So these things are, you know, they, people don't feel comfortable doing these things and 
as a result, uh, you know, stress testing was really kind of cast aside. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to go over this. Let's <coughs> keep moving. So, I've been talking about stress testing. I've been talking about models. It might be time to start um, describing stress testing. So, I start with a very general description. I'm not going to lie. I, I went on Wikipedia, which is the source of everything nowadays, and I, I looked at stress testing on Wikipedia, and, I, and the, the definition looked something very much like this. So, it's a form of testing that is used to determine the stability of a given system or entity. And it involves testing beyond normal operational capacity, often to a breaking point, in order to observe the results. Now, that's a very generic description, and it's not specific to finance. Now, in, depending on the industry you're in, this, stress, this definition of stress testing might have a more specific um, definition. So it, I'll come to the finance definition, which actually deviates quite a lot from this one, or at least the way we're doing it right now. But let me first start with something that you know probably a lot better than me, which is uh, stress testing in, in your field, or at least the field of many people in here. Uh, the, the, the example I love, and I, as you might have guessed uh, from Don's in, introduction, I fly a lot. I spend my life on a plane. And as a result, I've become pretty obsessed with um, um, plane stress testing. <laughs> I've watched the videos on YouTube of them stress testing triple sevens and things like that, just to make myself <coughs> comfortable with the fact that these that planes are actually uh, a very safe mode of transportation, and just reinforcing it in my brain. Um, until I fell on this, and I, by the way, as a result, I, I am not going to fly a 787 especially after what happened this week, forget it. I'm going to wait a couple of years before I get into one of those planes. But this is the Dreamliner, and uh, this is a, you know, it, it's something that, this was the main source of that big delay in the production of the Dreamliner. You know, it was supposed to be uh, ready, I mean the first one was supposed to fly commercially three years ago, I think, and I mean there was a, a two-year delay in the production. And the reason was this. They stress tested, and it was the, the wing stress test that failed. So the wing stress test, look it up on YouTube, it's really cool. What they do is, is they take a full-size plane, they tie it down, and then they put a crane on the wing, and they start lifting the wing until it breaks. <laughs> right? But it sounds stupid in a way, but that's stress testing, right? And basically they're trying to, uh, I, if I remember well, the objective is to have a wing that can withstand forces that are equivalent to 150% of the peak uh, normal force that a plane should encounter. Okay, And so here it failed way before, and it turns out it, it was like some real small detail uh, in the attachment here. Basically what happens is it, <coughs> they, as you know, they've used all these new composite materials, and the attachment of the wing to the fuselage was done with this little, I don't know what you even call this thing, uh, this little piece of metal basically, and this piece put some stress on the composite materials that they had not thought of, I mean they had not thought of this, that this is something they had not uh, predicted, and it, it actually tore it down here. And they would never have uncovered this. I mean, they would have uncovered it if the plane had flown, right? At some point, the stress would have been sufficient to have a plane crash, and then once the plane would have crashed, they would have done an investigation and figured it out. But instead, they actually used a, a life-size plane, stressed it, and uh, got the result and that they wanted, which is to find the failure in the plane, and they could, and they addressed. I mean, it cost them a lot of money, but it saved lots of lives and probably save Boeing in the long run, because had they flown that plane, I think uh, things would not have been that good for them. So in finance, what would the equivalent be? Well, it'd be for 
I don't know, me as a fit, it, it be for a bank to, to say, well, <coughs> we want to stress ourselves, so we need to take a life-size you know, model of our bank, stress it, make it fail, and, and then see what led to the failure. So obviously that's completely unrealistic. You, you, you cannot do that. You, you cannot create a fake bank, stress it, <laughs> and see when it is that, when it is that it's going to <coughs> So obviously in finance, we do it through modeling. Okay? And basically what we, what we want to do is stress the models themselves. But it will get to it. As a result, what is it that we're dealing with? I mean, we're in a world now in finance where I, I'm trying to do the to keep the analogy here with Boeing. Since we cannot build a life-size model of a bank, all we can do is rely on past history to build models to figure out what's going to happen. And so the Boeing example, the, and that's why I specifically chose a Dreamliner and not some other type of plane, is a perfect analogy. Why? Because a Dreamliner was is built out of completely new materials. So yes, you have data about plane crashes. You have data about how planes behave. But it's data that's not directly applicable to the plane that you just built. Right? The only w and by the way, the, the flaw in the design here was a flaw that was directly linked to the new materials that they were using. Right? And so the analogy in finance is you often come up to market, you know, you often have new products that come to market. You start selling new products. And what do you have to do? You have to take your historical data of similar products, build a model to try to predict how this new product is going to behave and what the risks are that are associated to this new product. So it would be as if Boeing took the data from its 777s and 767s and 747s to try to estimate and to model what would happen to a 787 in flight. They would have missed it as they did until they actually built the model. Okay? Furthermore, last point here is if, if anything, Boeing would have had a better chance at figuring it out than we do because at least they have the laws of physics on their side. Right? We don't, in finance, we, we have there's no law of finance, there's no law of economics, there's none of it. We're dealing with humans who are completely irrational. <laughs> well, humans, well, we're not going to get in a f philosophical debate on the rationality of the human species, but let's say that uh, we're, not only, we're not always as rational as we think we are, I think. And that, again, that's my very personal opinion, not that of... Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so as a result, when you're building a model, I mean, your model is only as good as the assumptions that go into it, the data that goes into it, and of course, the, one of the main assumptions is the behavioral assumption you make about market participants. So, this is where, no, this is what stress testing is, this is how it fits in the real world, and I gave you the analogy of stress testing in the real world with, with finance. So, now let's move to a better definition of stress testing in finance and the first thing I'm going to do is as I said at the beginning is give you a taxonomy of stress testing because what I just presented on the point with the Boeing example was really what we would call in finance a reverse stress test which is you stress test until something until it breaks and and then you try to to use that information to understand what it is that it would take to break your bank but that's a very specific type of stress test, and I'll get to the, the problems that we have with it. More generally, the way I like to think of it is that you have a continuum of types of stress tests. And I, you know, the way I remember it myself is I think of this continuum along the quant qual line. So on one hand, you have the quantitative stress test purely quantitative, and I'll, I'll get right away to the definitions. And on the other hand, you have the purely qualitative <coughs> stress test. So what is this? Well, what is a quantitative stress test? That's actually, in my mind, this is not really stress test, but 
to many people it is, and actually before the crisis, that's what, that was the predominant definition of stress testing. So that's, you have a model, your model is subject to parameter error, model error in the sense that you might use a certain distribution instead of another distribution. And so what you do is you stress your model. So let's say, I don't know, you have a model with a log normal distribution for losses and you try fitting a libel to your data and you try to see how it affects the, your VAR. So that's stress testing in a way to understand the impact of flawed assumptions on your, on your final result. Um, parameter error is even more basic, right? You have parameter estimation error and you're trying to understand you know, what if I'm off in my estimation of this parameter by that much, you know, how much is it going to affect my bar? So that's a form of stress testing, but again, if you think of it, at the end of the day, it's really part of sound modeling to do all these things. It's sensitivity analysis. It's not really stress testing. I mean, it, you cannot build a model and not explore alternatives. It just makes no, I mean, if you're a good modeler, you should never do that. Uh, so, a very weak form of stress testing, if you want. If you move along the line and you go more from the quant to the more qualitative side, there's somewhere in the middle there what, what I call the <coughs> macro stress testing or factor stress testing. And what this is, is you have your model, but what you do is instead of stressing the model itself, you're stressing the factors that go into your model. So most risk models are not built in a vacuum. Most risk models, uh, if you think, I don't know, let's take an example, credit risk models. You have probabilities of default and then losses given default. So you're trying to estimate the, you know, the risk or the losses in the portfolio of mortgages, let's say. What you have to do is you have to estimate you know, what's the probability of default for each in the mortgage in my portfolio, and then for each mortgage in my portfolio, if they default, what's the loss given default? And then you put all these things together and you, 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 get, you run it through your model and you get your loss, your, your loss distribution for your portfolio. Well, the probability of default of a certain individual is not a constant. It depends on the macroeconomic environment. So if you're unemployed, you're probably more likely to default than if you're fully employed. And your employment status depends on the general state of the economy. So if GDP, if, if, you're, if you're in a recession, you are more likely to find unemployed people in your portfolio and hence you're more likely to see an increase in your probabilities of default. So stress testing in that sense means that you build your model of credit risk in this example, but then <coughs> you, you calibrated it to, the, to today's condi macroeconomic conditions but you, and you look at what your VAR is for the next year. But if you want to stress test it, what you're going to do is you're going to assume, you're going to see what would happen if the economy took a nosedive. And, you know, and then you're going to stress your macroeconomic variables. You're going to see how, that stre how those stress variables impact all the inputs of your model. And then you're going to see um, what the outcome is from a portfolio perspective, you know, loss of distribution for your portfolio. So that's macroeconomic stress testing, that's factor stress testing, where instead of playing around with the factors of the model themselves, uh, the factor, I'm sorry, instead of playing with the parameters of your model or the model assumptions, what you're doing is you're keeping your model, you're assuming that your model is an accurate representation of reality, but you're, you stress what goes into it. And then at the, and I'm sorry, and before I get to that, the reason I put it in the middle of the two is it's not purely quantitative and the, the nature of the stress test is not purely quantitative. Why? Because you have to make assumptions about the macroeconomic environment. You have to build scenarios that are not necessarily a reflection of the past history. You, you just have to sit down and say, well, what, what things am I fearful about? for the future, you know? What are the macroeconomic things that I'm really concerned about? And the things you're concerned about 
could have nothing to do with what has been observed in the past. You, know, you could be fearful of certain macroeconomic scenarios that you have not yet experienced. But you can stress test your portfolio to see how your portfolio will behave in that environment. And so that's why it's a mix qualitative, quantitative stress <coughs> test, right? You're using your quantitative model, but with qualitative inputs to see how things, you know, to see how your portfolio will behave. And then at the other extreme, you have the purely qualitative stress test. And those, you know, the perfect example of those, even though some people would argue that you can do it quantitatively, is reverse stress testing. Reverse stress testing in the, you know, when I'm thinking of a bank, it's just not doable, really, quantitatively. Why? Because you're thinking, you know, what does it take for a bank to, to go bust? It takes a lot, especially for large banking, for larger banks. You know, think of a, I don't know, HSBC here <coughs> in, in the UK, or think of Bank of America, Wells Fargo, those trillion plus dollar institutions. For one of these institutions to go bust, I mean, it, it, it really takes a scenario that is not something you'll, you'll find really anywhere in your data. So you have to, in order to stress test the bank, at that end, to fail, and stress testing in the sense of what it does it take to, for the bank to, uh, um, to go bust, you need to have, you, you need to conduct some kind of tabletop <coughs> exercise. Right, where people sit down, managers sit down, and they try to figure out what it is, you know, what market conditions would dry up our liquidity and would make us go belly up. Yeah? And those are not things that you model. Those are things, I mean, models can help you quantify certain aspects of the whole thing, but in that sense, models are really just supporting evidence that you use in your general scenario analysis of what does it take to, to break the bank. Those a reverse stress test as a result is not really something you can use to estimate capital or anything like that. It's really a risk management tool that allows you to better understand where you might, or better identify the potential weaknesses in your institution. Because you might do it and then realize, well, actually, you know, it's more likely than I thought. You know, there are, we have certain fundamental weaknesses that we were not aware of that we need to deal with. Because if this and this happened, we actually might be in a pickle. But that's a very qualitative exercise. Okay? So this is, you know, the again how I personally think of stress testing. I, I always, you know, when somebody t tells me I'm stress testing and this is what I'm doing, I always try to to see where it falls on this continuum. You know? What are you doing? Are you really stress testing? Are you just you know, playing around with your parameters, or are you trying to do reverse stress testing, or are you trying to do a macro stress test? So, by the way, where does the Federal Reserve's stress testing exercise fall? I would say the first step, and we are going towards the second one. Yeah. So now, I mean, you know, in um, they're trying to be squarely here. So at first. You know, there were, you know, it was a little bit unclear, but now they've, they've, the Fed has really tried to, you know, the way it's defined, if you read it, it's really a macro stress test. Why? Because the Fed publishes um, a, a stressed macroeconomic environment. A variable, I mean, they, they publish the values of the number of macroeconomic variables, the values of a number of macroeconomic variables that are highly stressed. And then they ask banks, to um, provide their numbers for what would happen to them over a period of two years under those macroeconomic conditions. So this is what they're doing. The Fed comes up with those estimates, and it's a and it's this uh, you know, qualitative aspect. That's a, I, I would say the qualitative input. I mean, it, it's a mix of quant qual because you know the. These GDP unemployment numbers don't come out of thin air. There, there, there is some modeling involved, but there's also some um, you know, qualitative input going in there. And then they publish those things. And then the banks are asked to take these as inputs, run it through their models for all their portfolios, and give us 
give the Fed a picture of what they think would happen to them over a two-year period and make sure that from a capital point of view, they are, um, they are adequately capitalized and adequately is a, they have their own targets there. And if I have time, I'll come back to that later. Okay, so this, the Fed is trying to be squarely there. Um, <clears throat> the European stress tests now also fall under this. Uh, the FSA in the U uh, here in the UK has a reverse stress testing requirement. But if you go and read the FSA's reverse stress testing requirement, they, m they emphasize very much the fact that it should be done only for risk management purposes. That it should not be, you know, it's really an exercise to try to understand how resilient the institution is and to understand whether there are weaknesses. It's not an exercise to assess capital uh, adequacy. And I think that that's another big difference as you move along here, is that the more qualitative you become in your assessment, the less that assessment should be used for, uh, for capital purposes. You know, if you are trying to calculate capital, you're saying, well, I have capital that, I mean, you need probabilities. You need to be able to, to come up you know, with a capital number. Uh, and if you're going, let, let me take that back. <coughs> let me explain it differently. I can find many scenarios that will break my bank. The question is, will capital help? One, not necessarily. Two, even if capital helped, is it, re I mean, should I hold capital against that event? And now the question is, well, what's the probability of the event? So I, I can say I want to hold capital, I, I want to set a target to, that I'm going to survive at, with a 99.98 probability, which is typically what banks target because that's a triple, that's a double A rating. Okay, then in order to, for you to hold capital, you need to identify what is the 99.98 percentile of your loss distribution. Of, of your loss distribution. It, when you're doing reverse stress testing, you're not really looking at probabilities. You're just looking at what breaks the bank. Now you know what breaks the bank. The problem is you cannot assign a probability to it. So it makes it very difficult to actually come up with, to come up with an assessment as to whether you're adequately capitalized or not. So again, when it comes to capital, you need a more quantitative approach to it than uh, than you would under stress <coughs> uh, reverse stress testing. Good. So another way of thinking of it is, and I don't know how many of you know about Knightian uncertainty. So there's this whole concept of risk versus uncertainty uh, in economics, right? So risk is measurable. You don't know what the outcome will be, but you can measure the probabilities and you can manage it, right? So if I, if I throw a dice, a, yeah, if I throw a die, I know what the probabilities are. So I'm still exposed to risk, in the sense that I don't know which side will come up, but I know that each side has a one, six, one over six probability. So here, I just give it, well, it's 0.8 probability that it's sunny, 0.2 that it's stormy. Uncertainty is you don't really, you don't, there's risk, but you don't know what the probabilities are. Okay, so you, I, in a very simple model here, you, in one state of the world, this is your risk. But in another state of the world, this is your risk. There's a 0.5 probability that it's sunny, a 0.4 that it's stormy, and a 0.1 that it's actually going to snow. The problem is, you don't know with what probability you're going to be in which state of the world. If you knew, then you know, of course you're back in the risk environment. Because if you know that it's, let's say, one half, one half, then you can calculate all the probabilities all the way through. But there are situ situations where you don't even know that. And you know, when you're doing reverse stress testing, I was talking about the ability to calculate capital. You're, that's really what you're dealing with. You can evaluate what it would take to break the bank, but you just have this big question mark here, which makes it 
impossible for you to assign capital or anything like that to it. Okay, so if I add this <laughs> layer to my taxonomy, typically the way that you would look at it is when you're here, you're really dealing with pure risk, everything that's measurable. And as you're moving down the line here, you're moving more and more into this uncertainty world where things are less, are, are less compute, uh, you, you can less and less calculate those things. Okay, so here you go. Beyond the fact that now we have a, a framework to think about stress testing, I think the big thing to take away from this is also that you need to know why you're doing the, you're conducting the exercise in order to know what how you need to do it. So, if you want to focus on capital adequacy for your institution, then you need something along the macro. I mean, I'm ignoring the first piece, which is the parameter stress testing, because I think that that's part of sound model building. So I'm focusing really on the macro factor stress testing and the reverse stress testing. So if capital adequacy is your target, then macro stress testing or factor stress testing is really the tool to go about it. Because you want to know if next year, under those circumstances, you would be adequately capitalized, then that's macro stress testing. If risk management is your objective, then reverse stress testing might be the right tool. I mean, I'm not saying this tool, is I mean, macro stress testing is always going to be useful. I mean, you're always going to identify uh, weaknesses. But it, if you're not interested for that in that specific instance with capital and then you really want to understand the risk, then reverse stress testing and scenario type stress testing can be a very useful tool because it will allow you to have you know to have people sit down around the table and identify all the weaknesses that exist in your institution. Good. So I, I just added you know a few uh, examples that, that are all real life examples. I mean, none of this is made up. Just to show the the fact that model, you know, how how common it is to have models that fail. And I start with uh, uh, something that actually is uh, very appropriate given that we're here, which is a the population of London forecasts. So this was done in the um, in the 90s, and. Um, it's people were forecasting the population of London. And so what do you think the forecasting here is? So if I asked you to use this data to forecast, what would you do? I mean, obviously, I wouldn't put it if it was not obvious what the people did, right? It's like people just forecast this. Right? They did a linear regression on the population trends over the past 40 years. And what happened? Well, this is what happened, right? And it's just to show that, you know, again, you're building a model based on historical data, based on very specific assumptions. Of course, you are bound to make mistakes. And the, of course, and the more simplistic your model, the more likely you, it is to fail. Now, this is not to say that it's unavoidable, that if everybody would make this mistake, it's just that you need to you need to go to dig deeper. You need to do some kind of stress testing and more and deeper analysis of the of the trends to understand why population was declining. Look at where the city is going and why the population, um, uh, why the trend reverted. My favorite example, being an asset pricer, is this one. And this is uh, I'm not going to claim ownership on this one. This is. Um, uh, what's it? <coughs> not going to claim ownership, but I cannot assign ownership either. That's pretty, pretty bad. It was a professor at Penn that pre presented this uh, during a conference, and I thought that the, this was an amazing example. Um, so this is a distribution of the S&P 500 monthly returns, and on which he, over he overlaid a, a normal distribution. So the normal distribution is the dark blue one. 
and these are the actual monthly returns. What would you say? Pretty good fit. I mean, obviously there are there's a, something going wrong there, but overall it it seems pretty good. Plus, if you care about risk management, what do you care about? The extremes, right? So you're gonna say, well, it's a little bit off here, but it seems that on the t the tails actually are are pretty good. Well, that's until you zoom in, right? If you focus on the tails, you'll see that there's actually, <coughs> that in the tails, your returns deviate quite significantly from the normal distribution. And actually, from pretty much any distribution. So this is, instead of looking at the variance, expected value variance plane, what you're looking at here is the skewness, well, skewness squared and kurtosis plane. So you take the, skew, the skewness and kurtosis of your actual data, and then you compare it to the combinations of, skew, of skewness and kurtosis that the different families of distributions can generate, right? And let's look at it. If you look at the annual total returns, <coughs> a log normal can actually generate that combination spot on. If I look at the monthly returns, none of the families of distributions that we use on a regular basis can generate anything close to what we observe in the data. If I look at the weekly, about the same. S&P daily is actually, uh, if I remember, it would be like uh, 32, uh, somewhere above on the next floor. Impossible for any distribution to generate any anything close to this. So what this is telling us is, even if I match the first two moments of my distribution, which is good for most of the uh, applications, you know, for pricing is probably good enough. When we start thinking of risk management, we we are thinking about the tails, you know, when things go really wrong. And if we use the distributions and assess the quality of the fit to the data based on those moments, we are missing a big piece of the picture, which is that none of these distributions are capable of matching any of the third and fourth moment characteristics, which are what define the fatness of your tails. Right? So this is to say, again, models will fail. You just need to be aware of it. So by the way, how bad is it? So what's the probability of uh, the, the distribution of daily data being, of daily returns being um, normal? It's uh, 10 to the power 603, right? 1 over 10 to the power 603, so it's basically 0. OK, last example. And, and this is again to make, so the first example, uh, the first financial example is really to make the point about model error and that you, know, you can be blinded by your statistics and you, you need to always take a step back and put things in perspective and, well, and realize that again, it's an approximation. It serves it, you know, it works well until it doesn't work because you know, 90, actually 99%, 99.9% of the time, your normal distribution will do a pretty good job. Uh, of course, the one percent, the point one percent of the time is the, the one that you care about. Here, it's a slightly different story. Um, it's a it's a story of basically regime change, and the fact that, and I think this fits much better into in the story of uh, macro stress testing, where your model can be right, but you you know you need to feed it with the right assumptions. So this is. The daily percent change in the peso dollar exchange rate. So this is uh, about a year of data. Okay. So if I asked you to basically give me, you know, what's the 0.1 percent percentile of the distribution of the rate of change of the, the, the exchange rate here, you'd say, well, you know, maybe four percent. I don't know. You, you might extrapolate a little bit further out, right? This is what happens next, right? So just for you, this is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm missing a box here. Basically the previous slide, this slide, 
is the data up to here. Okay. Right, where the maximum was, I think, on the positive side, plus 3%, and on the negative side, minus 3.5%. And, and then, of course, the crisis occurs. And you know, what looked like you know, fairly reasonable variation here, you, you know, I mean, you had quite a lot of variation in your data, now it just looks like it was pretty much a flat line up to that point. Um, what happened then was a, the equivalent of a, you know, a 44 standard deviation event, which I hate this. I hate it when people talk in those terms because of, when you're talking of 44 standard deviation event, you, you're automatically basically putting yourself in a normal framework, right? If it were a normal distribution, it would be a 44 standard deviation event. Well, obviously, that's a problem. You, know, you should not be using a, a normal distribution at all here. Uh, but beyond that, I think you here this highlights another problem, which is your mo what I started with, which is that your models are just local approximations. So your model could work very well in this area of the graph, and then you could build a new model that will work very well here. Or you, if you have factor-driven models, you can have your model, and under certain you know, under certain macroeconomic conditions, you're here. And then if you stress your macroeconomic conditions, you're in this environment. But the thing is, when you're making your decisions, or when you're calculating your capital here, you cannot assume that this is, this, this is a full reflection of reality. You have to be aware of the fact that under certain circumstances, things can blow up. And this is where stress testing comes in, especially micro stress testing. Macro stress testing allows you to basically introduce this kind of stress in your model by stressing the factors uh, that uh, inform your model. Okay, now I'm going to give you a second reason why uh, stress testing and especially microeconomic stress testing <laughs> is actually so important. So now we have, you know, I went over I think I beat it to death, this whole concept of model failure. But there is, you know, people in the um, press often blamed the Basel II requirements for the prices, which is kind of uh, ludicrous in a way, especially that if you think about the fact that the crisis pretty much originated in the US, and in the US we don't have a single bank that's Basel that was Basel II, uh, that it was operating under Basel, from the Basel II regime at that time. We still have no bank that operates under Basel II right now. So blaming it on Basel II is kind of weird. Um, why do they, why, but still, let's, let's go through the argument because, you know, if there's a nugget of truth in it, you know, it, it will have, it, it will be very important in the future. And so basically the argument there is that of capital for cyclicality, which is, you calculate capital at a certain point in time based on the recent history and based on current macroeconomic conditions. And you're looking a year ahead. And you build like, the, the distribution of where things could go within a year. And then you, ca you set your capital, I don't know, at the 99.9th percentile of that distribution of losses for the, few, for the next year. Now, in a good e macroeconomic environment, what happens? your capital will be pretty low. Things look rosy, uh, actually uh, the, right before the crisis, if you ask people what, they're, you know, what they thought that would happen to housing prices in the US, and I actually had this discussion with a number of bankers, they would say, well, housing prices can never drop in real terms. Why? Well, it's never happened. And the last time it happened was during the Great Depression, and that's never going to happen again. And now we're much more diversified. We might have localized drops, like in Texas and California, but the U.S. is so big, you're never going to have uh, housing prices going negative across the board. So what does that mean? That means that they built all their models with a distribution of house price changes that were only on the positive domain, right? Maybe they would allow for a little bit of negativity, but not much. Okay, so now you calculate your capital under that condition. Now, if you calculate your capital today, where you have a data point 
of minus 30%, what happens? Well, your capital requirement today will be, I don't know, double, triple what it was five years ago. You're the same bank, you're, let's assume, they're not the same banks, they don't have the same portfolios, but you're the, let's assume you're the same bank, you're exposed, you, you have the same portfolio, and your capital went from this to this. That's capital per cyclicality. And what's the problem for, with that is that, you know, the moment, you know, in the worst part of the business cycle, banks have to increase their capital levels, hence they have to restrict lending. So this is something that ideally you probably would not want to see. And so stress testing, in a way, can be seen as a tool to actually kind of smooth the, the cyclicality of capital. Why? Because if you are in 2006 and you're calculating your capital and you actually stress it to see what, you know, what would happen in a very stressful environment, you might make the decision to actually hold a little bit more capital than what your simplistic model based on recent history would tell. So to, uh, to highlight, you know, to, to, um, to illustrate this, I, I'm going to use Goodhart, Hoffman, and Segoviano, the, the, the 2004 paper, which is really interesting. What they did is it's a purely stylized bank. Uh, a purely stylized bank portfolio. They have a thousand loans per portfolio, and um, what they do is they they calculate the capital for that portfolio according to three methodologies: uh, standardized approach. So standardized approach is a uh, it's a, a Basel formula. So if you, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but there's an equation that the that's written in the Basel rule that's that gives you the um, that, 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 that that tells you how much capital you should hold for a certain specific portfolio. Then there's what we call the IRB approach. Um, so the IRB approach is basically you calculate your probability of default, you calculate all the metrics of your portfolio, and you build a model and then you feed it through the IRB equation, which, uh, no, I re okay, so for those who, of you who are not familiar, this might be a little bit confusing, but um, uh, basically what it is, uh, oh, well, I'm gonna, gonna put this very simply. Uh, okay, what they did basically in, in, the, uh, in, in the Accord is they took the, an equation of a single factor model. So, they, and I'm not sure how many of you know credit risk, so this is going to be a little bit weird. Uh, okay, let's say, okay, let's do it very simply. And let's say there is an equation that's given, that's provided to the banks by the accord, and it's a, an asymptotic, uh, it's the result, it's the asymptotic result of. Um, an equation that's actually valid for a very a highly granular portfolio of um, a highly granular credit portfolio. So if you had a portfolio of millions of obligors, of loans, uh, none of which is too big, and that depends on only one macroeconomic factor, the, the equation would asymptotically hold. And so the Accord provides this equation as the equation that banks have to use to calculate capital in an IRB framework. And the reason they, you know, so the reason they use this very simplistic equation is so that everybody calculates capital in the same fashion. So that it's, even though the, the, the assumptions might not hold bank by bank, at least it's, it gives a, you know, a baseline that everybody uses and that makes it comparable bank across bank, even if some of the violations are violated, uh, some of the assumptions are violated. And then, there's what you would they call the uh, improved credit risk method or the Merton approach, which is basically build a full model to model your credit risk. It's build a multi-factor model that tries to explain the risk in your portfolio as well as as well as possible. So instead of using this uh, asymptotic result, one factor asymptotic result. And so here's what the picture looks like with that real. I mean that it's a uh, 
it's a fake portfolio, but it's based on real data <coughs> of a thousand um, uh, obligors. And what happens is that you know, when you're using the standardized approach, because it's not risk sensitive at all, it looks pretty much like a flat line. I mean, it does react a little bit, but your capital is pretty much flat. And the more risk sensitive your approach is, the more pro-cyclical your capital becomes. Why? Because you're doing a great job at explaining the risk in your portfolio, but the risk, in your, because you're explaining it so well, the risk changes as the, the, the macroeconomic environment changes. And so what happens is that in good times, you, your risk is fundamentally lower. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You, the, if I ask you what's the one in, a, you know, one in a hundred probability of default right now, I'm sorry, what's the probability of default right now? It's much lower than it was three years ago in the middle of the crisis. There's no doubt about it. So your risk is really, truly lower today. And, and this is reflected in the, the, capital, uh, the capital ratios that you have. And this is what we call capital procyclicality. And stress testing can be seen as a way to address this. Why? Well, because when you're here and the, the macroeconomic environment is good, you force your institutions or your models to consider what would happen in the downturn. And now you're like, okay, well actually, if tomorrow we were hit by a crisis, our capital requirement would move all the way up here. So what's the probability of this happening? Maybe we should hold capital to protect ourselves against this. Okay, and so the result would be that at this point here in 1983, you would choose to hold a little bit more capital so that come the crisis of the early 90s, I mean, your capital probably would, your requirement would still go up a little bit, but the jump would not be as stressful as it was. Okay? And so that's another thing that stress testing allows you to do. So basically, there's two things that it's, you know, that stress testing allows you to deal with here. The first piece is, you know, what I spent most of my time talking about up to now, which is the fact that models are inherently prone to error, and that you might be making mistakes in your modeling, and that as a result you need to, you know, to test that. But even if your model is accurate, your model is still calibrated point in time. And you might want to avoid, and hence you know that even if it's perfectly accurate, your capital will move up and down over the cycle, and that might not be healthy for you as an institution. And you might want to try to avoid it, and hence you try to calculate your, the probability of your, um, of you being in that state of the world, and try to reflect that in your current capital. Yeah. Good. So, as a summary of macro stress testing, I have this slide which is, you know, it basically tells you what you know, all the things I just said uh, about macro stress testing. Um, the num point number two here is an important one, which is when you're doing macro stress testing, most of the time you're assuming that your model is inherently correct but that you're calibrating it on either the wrong factors or on the factors that just reflect current, the current state of the world, but knowing well that very soon there, you know, you could, things could change and that the factors could fundamentally change. A perfect example of this is what, you know, often think of, asset, think, think of the market and you know, calculating market risk on a portfolio of stocks or something like that. What do most people do? They, you know, when they calibrate those things, they do it with a five week, you know, typically you use a five year window of data, right? So if you do it now, of course your five year window of data will include uh, quite a stressful period. But if you did it in 2006, okay, let's say seven, so that we can cut off the old one. <coughs> the 2000, well, 2006 was good. It would have been right after the March 2000 crash. So, you know that that window would have taken that data point out. So the the point is, you know, when you're 
you calculate, you always have to use a, the sample that you think is relevant to your risk at a certain point in time. Stress testing is, a, is all about going back in history and looking at what happened in 87, what happened in March of 2000, uh, what happened in 08, in 08, in the fall of 08, and so on and so forth. It's really about, you know, re assuming your model is right, but stressing the factors that go into it. Uh, this is actually very important. It, it might seem very, it might seem simplistic to people who are not in the banking industry, but it, it's a big deal. And it's this idea, this concept of holistic approach. Banks are behemoths. I mean, they're huge. In, I mean, you think, I don't know, JP Morgan, I think, is close to $2 trillion now. So you're the chief risk officer of that bank. How do you think you manage that risk? I mean, it's very hard for you to have a, a, an overall view of what's happening in the institution. And for the longest time, what happened is what you call siloing. The banks would have risk teams that would focus on credit risk. And within credit, it would be credit card, uh, auto loans, mortgages, um, wholesale credit to AAA companies, or wholesale credit to uh, to double B companies, and, and they partition it. And there are people who specialize in modeling each one of these aspects. And then there's operational risk, and there's market risk, and then there's this risk. And, every, and so you have a team dedicated to each one of these risks. And each one of these teams has a very good understanding of the risk at hand. But there's no overall picture. There's no, no, there was no effort to put all these things together. I mean, yeah, they, they put everything together on a PowerPoint, but it doesn't mean that you really have a holistic approach, which is, you know, what if there's a, uh, a downturn tomorrow? Well, and then they would tell you, well, we don't have GDP in our, in our model. Oh, we don't use unemployment in our model. So the focus of each team was to understand as well as they could the risk and model it as well as they could. But that means that they were overly specific in the way they modeled it, which is good because it allows them to get a good picture. But nobody took a step back to see what, what that meant for the whole institution. And they said the stress testing, as it's uh, required by the Federal Reserve, or actually by law now, is really forcing institutions to rethink this. Why? Because now you have all these macroeconomic variables. You're telling them, well, it's unemployment. it's uh, GDP, it's you know, it's a bunch of macroeconomic variables, and now their banks force themselves to translate those variables into factors for the, all the models, and so now you can stress all your portfolios at the same time, and get the overall picture at the top of the house, as opposed to what was happening, which was well, what if my credit card portfolio is stressed? Well, they would tell you what happens then, and then somebody else would tell you what happens if this portfolio is stressed. The problem is, what if those two things happen together? And that, this is what stress testing has allowed them to rethink the way they're doing things. Um, finally, is that the way the, the Federal Reserve I mean, it was, it exercise is called CGAR, which is Comprehensive Capital Assessment. This is very different from calculating just capital demand, uh, capital <coughs> supply, I'm sorry. You know, there's two parts to capital management, to, to, to the capital of an institution. One is how much capital do you have today, and that's the capital that you set aside. Uh, you have all these models, ba take Basel, Basel tells you how much capital you need to have. Capital adequacy looks at both sides of it. How much capital do you have, but also how much capital you're using during the downturn, you know, when the crisis hits, you might be burning through this capital at such a rate that, you know, capital will not be sufficient. And by the way, the capital is calculated usually with a one-year horizon. Stress testing here is looking at a two-year horizon uh, on a quarterly basis. And so what you can see is that uh, what happens sometimes is that at the end of those two years, you might have been adequately capitalized from a Basel II perspective at the beginning, but then once you look at what happens at the end, you, you end up with no capital at all. 
your capital requirement, and especially if you look at it from a ratio point of view, your capital requirements have been going up because of the downturn. That's what we looked at with procyclicality. But at the same time, you've been burning through capital because of the downturn. And so stress testing is really allowing you to, to look at those two things at the simultaneously. But stress testing as it is being done in the CCAR sense. What are the main issues that we're encountering with uh, stress testing? Okay. First thing is what we call the translation. And it goes back to what I was just talking about, which is risk models are built to understand the risk in each one of your portfolios specifically. <coughs> so they're very tailored made to those portfolios. And as a result, they might not use as inputs any of the variables that you would uh, use in the stress testing environment, in the in the in the stress testing exercise, uh, which are typically macroeconomic variables. And so what happens is that you have to take the macroeconomic variables as they are provided to you, and then translate them somehow into factors that are meaningful to your stress. Uh, I'm sorry, to your risk models, the models that will give you. That, that will tell you what happens in the specific portfolio. Uh, and that's actually become a very tough thing to do. Uh, I personally spend a lot of time working in operational risk. It's very hard to translate GDP ch changes in GDP and changes in unemployment to anything meaningful from an operational risk perspective. So the, this translation of macro variables to variables that are meaningful to your model is actually a big, big deal. Uh, and it's one of the big hurdles that uh, people are facing when building, uh, when running, when going through a stress test exercise. Furthermore, you need to make sure that the different teams that translate the macro variables into factors that are for their models do it in a coherent way. Because remember, it's you know, if the credit, if one team is translating GDP this way and then another team translates GDP in a different way, uh, you need to make sure that those two things are compatible and they're actually thinking about the same storyline. That, Because remember, stress testing is this holistic exercise and you need to make sure that uh, everybody across the institution is doing something similar. Uh, comprehensiveness. Uh, well, risk stylus are still here. And here to say, I say, well, I mean, that's unavoidable. You need people who really understand the risk to focus on that risk. So there, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with having risk silos. But at the same time, you need to be able to kind of break down, or not break them down, but link those silos somehow. And this is what stress testing is doing. It's really trying to connect the different silos across the institution in a coherent manner. Uh, so, yeah, I already talked about this, and this is too specific for you guys, I think. Good. So, last point I want to make. Good. So, the last point I want to make is discuss a common misconception. I mean, maybe it's not a misconception in this audience. <laughs> it's been typically a misconception in, when I talk to bankers. Um, bankers think, uh, in general, in, that, in the risk world, people think a lot of uh, stress testing a lot, as something, as a movement along a specific loss distribution. So imagine that you have a loss distribution for a portfolio and that what you're doing is you're moving from one quantile of your distribution to the next one, right? So I put it here. So typically they'll say, well, this is my, dist my loss distribution for the portfolio. And stress testing is I basically go to a higher bar, right? I go from the 99th percentile to the 99th point ninth percentile. And actually, no. The way micro stress testing works fundamentally is you are moving your whole distribution. You're saying, this is my loss distribution under those conditions. Good economic environment, these are my factors. And I get my blue distribution. 
And I look at the, my, actually, <coughs> typically you, look, you would not even look at a high percentile from a capital ad, you know, uh, adequacy point of view. You're just going to look at your expected loss. How much do you expect to lose per quarter in this environment? Then you say, okay, now the economy is stressed. Well, what's going to happen is my distribution will move as a, the whole distribution moves to the right. I'm in a stressed environment. Now all the probabilities, all my VARs are higher. And my expected loss moves from here to here. And that's your capital usage. Your loss is going up. You're using more capital per quarter. So again, <laughs> remember, I, we're not dealing necessarily with capital supply. How much capital do I need to hold at this point? You're looking at how much capital am I burning through quarter per quarter. And the idea is, well, then you look at the change in your loss distribution. Okay. By the way, final point. It, uh, it also affects your capital supply. Uh, yeah, the capital supply, because what is your, let's take the Basel II <coughs> world where you typically would hold capital at the 99.9th .9 percentile. What this is telling you is, well, the 99.9th .9 percentile, I don't know, is somewhere here for the blue one. For the yellow one, it'd be somewhere here. So not only is your expected loss gonna go up and you're gonna burn through capital more, uh, more quickly, but in order to keep your ratio, I mean, in order to keep meeting your capital requirements from a Basel II perspective or from a general regulatory perspective, you also have to hold more capital. So it's a double whammy in the, uh, in the downturn. Okay. Good. So the conclusion is the, the first thing is what you want from a stress testing exercise really determines the kind of stress testing that you're going to run. So I spent a lot of time here talking about macroeconomic stress testing because that's, what's, that's what we do now in the US for CCAR and that's what most people think of as stress testing right now in general. It's like really understand what happens if the macroeconomic environment is stressed. But as we saw, if your objective is not necessarily capital, assessment, but it's risk management, then you can run more scenario driven, more qualitative type of, of uh, stress tests such as reverse stress testing. Number two, when you're running macro stress testing, the, the ability to assign probabilities <coughs> to your different scenarios is actually pretty important. You're in the business of assessing capital. In order to assess capital, you need to assess you need to be able to assess percentiles of certain loss distribution. So you need to be able to assign probabilities to different events so that you can calculate your capital requirements. Um, third is the need to build structural models. So those are the translation models that I talked about that link factors to risk, uh, I'm sorry, that link macroeconomic variables to factors that are used in risk models. You cannot just, you know, if you go to a bank and you tell them, here's, I mean, that's what we did, basically. We took, Here are the macro variables. You get a blank stare. It's like, you know, what the hell are you asking? I mean, what do we do with this? I mean, none of our models have these variables in them. And so the first step is, well, you have to basically reinvent the wheel in a way. You have to build all these models to translate the variables, and you have to adjust all the, the risk models that you have so that they can use those factors. And then de-siloing is crucial. Um, well, it's this, again, the point that I made earlier, which is if you're looking at every risk independently, you're missing the big picture. So when you're running stress, te uh, stress testing exercise, you become less precise in the way you're assessing every risk, but you're assessing the whole thing comprehensively. So, I mean, you're still going to have the risk silos so that, peop that people in the business want to really understand things that are specific to that business, but from a top of the house point of view, you're running your micro stress test, you, it, you can afford to have a less specific model to the, each one of the risks, <coughs> but make sure that they all react and respond to the same kinds of variables and they're all linked. Okay? Good. And so, yeah, that was it. Um, that's, uh, I hope I didn't confuse you too much, you know, I'm sorry. As I was talking, I realized that there are some things, even though I was warned, and I tried to uh, 
adapted. Uh, I realize there are some aspects of the, of the presentation that might have uh, been a little bit of obscure to you. Uh, so I apologize for that. I still hope that you got the general gist of it. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Will it change the model? Uh, well, I mean, again, if, if you think of it in, the, in terms of the silos, what I see changing is the silos you're involved with as an institution, right? So you see many institutions um, getting out of certain types of businesses uh, because those businesses have capital requirements or regulatory requirements that are that don't make them profitable anymore and you're going to see hedge funds or other alternative you know other types of institutions get less regulated institutions getting to that business so from the bank's point of view it changes how they estimate their risk but only in the sense that they don't have that risk anymore but I don't think that it, it will change for example when you're looking at a credit card portfolio that it will change fundamentally how you calculate the risk for your credit card portfolio. The risk is the risk of your customer <coughs> and, and the risk that your customers expose you to does not depend on you know, the, fi you know on, on the financial on the structure of the financial uh, markets. That, that just affects the kinds of businesses you're in, involved in. I've seen in the variety of banks that since the financial crisis, the amount of stress testing done up has rocketed through the roof, which obviously affects banks both resources and salary wise. Do you think the level that we're currently at is here to stay, or do you think it's a more just a knee jerk reaction and it will plateau off a bit? Oh, God. Um, yeah, sorry, but I waited. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I, I think it's here. To, I mean, the requirements are here to stay. Uh, if you look, at, at, at least in the U.S. and uh, even in Europe now with the VA stress test, that's not going anywhere. Uh, so the demand will be there. What will change is that right now there's this build-up phase. Nobody knew to, how to really do it. You had to rethink the way you, you model risk in many you know, at that level. Uh, you had to build all these translation engines, so you have you, you really had to introduce a number of new tools to the, uh, to the mix, and I think that's why you see this heightened activity. As these things become more common, better established, uh, the amount of stress testing being done will be the same. It just will become part of regular business. So I think the resources required to do it will. But right now, I mean, for the next two, three years, this is just going to be <coughs> a lot of work. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the Fed gives to the banks certain scenarios uh, mm -hmm. to run, uh, and then uh, banks uh, publish some results based on these scenarios. Uh, each bank creates its own model to test uh, yes. these scenarios. Is that an uh, objective or uh, an so object? Because some banks could. Uh, Let's say, say that uh, some variables are uh, seen differently? From yeah, absolutely. So, that's a good question. Um, the Fed provides the scenario and the variables, and then it's up to the banks to run these through their models to come up with their assessment. But, it, you know, it's not like uh, you can do whatever you want. I mean, there are people from Fed who will review the modeling that you did, the banks did, and and assess whether it was adequately it was done correctly or not, or done to the satisfaction of the regulator. That's, that's a difficult terminology that you would use, right? So the bank doesn't just give a number. The bank actually provides you know thousands of pages of this is what we did, and there's a whole team from the regulatory side that will go through it and try to evaluate the quality of the work that was done. That's one. Then the Fed itself 
builds its own models and stresses, use, gets data from the banks and stresses the banks according to the same scenarios. And what the Fed does is it uses the same model for all banks. So that resolves the, fact, the problem that you mentioned, which is you know, two banks with the same portfolio could have a different model and hence come up with a very different result given the same scenario. And that's where the Fed comes in. We build a model that if you have the same portfolio, you will actually have the exact same, you know, you, you will fare exactly the same way through our model. So it eliminates the difference between banks. But now, we still want, I mean, you, you cannot rely on one model because the Fed models can make mistakes. So you want to, you know, that's why we also ask the banks to build their models. Plus, banks, you know, they know their risk better than anybody else in a way. So they're, it, it's very important to have those two points of view, to have the bank point of view, which is their model, and we ask them to tell us what they think the risk is, and then there's the Fed model that, you know, it's our point of view about the risk. And I, you know, I don't think any of them is necessarily the right answer. The right answer is probably somewhere in between. behavioral assumptions yes. and things of that type. Oh, God. Uh, uh, people have, I mean, there, people are doing research on that, but right now, if you look at the, the, the risk models, there's no, there are no behavior. Well, actually, you could, but I haven't really seen it yet. But you could uh, start building, especially in, credit card models and models of that type, you could start building into those uh, behavioral assumptions. By the way, during the crisis, we did see some major changes in the US. Um, what was it? Th there was a, a, a huge change in consumer behavior and, and, and what loans they were paying first. Yeah, that was it. That typically, the first thing consumers would, in terms of mortgage uh, loans, uh, that they would pay back is mortgages. They don't want to lose their house. Um, and the big change here was that consumers were first paying their credit card debt, their car loans, and then mortgages. And and that was a, a, a radical break with with historical behavior. And I mean, when you think about it, then it makes sense, right? And, you know, the stigma of defaulting and change plus so many more people were underwater, and so what happens is they, they wanted to maintain their liquidity, and that was the important thing, so they paid the credit cards, so that they, they had that, and they wanted to maintain their ability, so they paid their car loans. You can always live in your car. So and you can always live in your car. That's <laughs> with a credit card. <laughs> plus, I mean, plus, when there was such a glut of, um, of uh, foreclosures, people were not necessarily kicked out of their home right away, so you had it was common to have stories of people staying in the houses one or two years after the foreclosure process had started. So, you know, but that, if, if you had built a model before the crisis, you know, most modelers would have assumed that the first thing the consumers would pay was their mortgage. And actually that completely changed. So in a way, yes, you are right that you, there are ways to introduce some kind of behavioral assumptions and behavioral changes in the models, but I mean, uh, I'd say that's going to be further down the road because now people are really trying to still deal with the very basic questions of how to model this. Yeah. I have one more fundamental question. You said the difference between risk and uncertainty, and um, you said that the, the, the parameters and the anticipation and the predicting stuff is more for risk because you can somehow assess more percentages, how often it will happen. 
how likely it is to fail if this is going to something like this. Yeah. I don't really understand why this could happen. Because, as you said now, if the, if the what basically is wrong in, in the scenario that you said is that people, well, you know, the, the order, how people prioritize their debt, then you have a kind of parameter change, or you have some, something wrong with parameters. Yeah, that's what actually happened. So, as I understood from the slides, normally you sh should be able to kind of map the kind of um, yeah, how wrong your parameters are to kind of a certainty or something or you know, certainly more or certainly some kind of, some kind of um, probability or something. Uh -huh. But I don't see that so much. Is it, uh, did that mean something? In no, th that's why I'm saying this is not really being modeled yet. I mean, in a stress testing context, that's why behavior is also very difficult because I mean you don't. You, it's very hard to map probabilities to these events. Yes, so, but if you have just, I mean, any parameter could be wrong with any kind of, um, you know, if you have a singular event like you said, for instance, like a machine change or something, it's just uh, in, in some sense un unpredictable. Absolutely. And um, so, this kind of parameters could be wrong with any kind of probability. Well, I, I, but I think that's really. The whole point of that, uh, the taxonomy is that there are things that, you know, there's this unknown unknown. There are things that you know could potentially happen, and you just don't know what the probabilities are. And there's no point in trying to integrate those in a modeling framework, because the what you're trying to understand when you're <laughs> thinking about these extreme changes is, am I prepared from a risk management point of view, and you know, do I have the the ability to react to such a situation? It, it's pointless to try to es estimate capital at that point in time. You know, for certain, for like, if I take the peso, I mean, okay, the peso is a bad idea because people could see it coming. But you know, there are things that you can start thinking about, and there's no point in modeling or even holding capital against it because there's. There's no way you can assess the probability of these things happening. You can say, well, it, it could happen, but so I'm prepared, I'm not prepared. I just don't know what the probability is, and I just know it's re it's very remote. It's like, could um, could we have a uh, an asteroid strike the Earth tomorrow? Yes. I know the question is, are we going to stop doing everything we're doing to prepare for that? No. I mean, so it's the same thing with the banking industry. You know, if, if the equivalent asteroid could hit the banking industry. Now the question is, does it make sense to prepare yourself? I mean, to hold capital against that event? Probably not. And the thing is, you don't even know the probability. You just know it's remote enough that it's of no concern. But thinking about the scenario is a useful exercise because it allows you to think about whether you are prepared for similar types of events. Even if you think they're remote, Maybe there are cheap things you could do that could help you improve your risk management right now. But you should not use it for capital calculation purposes or for capital adequacy uh, evaluation. And that's really, you know, when I was thinking of risk and uncertainty, that's the, what I had in mind there. Okay, good. Uh, big round of applause. make one reminder to you folks um, on Wednesday the 16th I don't think they'll top Evans performance but on Wednesday the 16th we have a panel debate on Basel 3 so that was the question I asked think that that we, uh, we avoided and on Thursday the 17th we <coughs> have um, the chief risk officer from Alliance the European insurance company will address enterprise risk in a uh, in game on, on, on a Thursday evening. So please check the UCL Funds website. Both these things should be almost as inspirational as that. When is that? Allianz? No, but you're on a flight tomorrow. Allianz is on Thursday. Tom Wilson. All this week. Thank you very much, folks. And I think Evan will be here for a couple of minutes if you want to yep. have a quick question or um, have, a, have a thought. Thank you.